morning we are looking at the question of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's contribution to secular Christianity theology. Uh, let me start with a very important summary statement that will set the scene for what's happening in the writings of Bonhoeffer and especially what is happening in the post-Bonhoeffer interpretations, and that will be our subject this morning, the radical interpretations of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And you'll understand this sentence and you'll recognize it as being one that comes out of our background of studies in secularism and secularization. Theologians from the Second World War onward have thought that they had to deal realistically with a new world situation of human autonomy created by science and technology. And that's what I'd like to start with this morning, if you could get that down. Theologians from the Second World War, from the war years onward, <clears throat> have thought they had to deal, quote, realistically, unquote, with a new world situation of human autonomy, which has been created by science and technology. Uh, where man can govern his own world without recourse to the deity. where it basically self-governing is what the word means where but in this context where man can govern his own life and affairs without reference to or without recourse to a higher being the deity okay a new world uh, let me go back earlier uh, to deal realistically with a new world situation of human autonomy created by science and technology. And this becomes especially true in the 1960s, which is where we're heading very quickly here this morning. And I think we've seen some of this in the neo-evangelical world as well. Times have changed. Things have altered. People are different. Theology has to change to keep up with the pace. Well, I don't believe so. I believe that we can stay with the old, old way, and it always answers man's problems and his deepest needs and questions. And if it doesn't answer certain things, it probably means those things aren't worth discussing or talking about, or that we don't need to know the answer if it happens to be something so high or so supreme, such as, well, what was God doing before he made the worlds? Augustine had the answer. He was creating hell for people like you who ask such questions. <laughs> I've never forgotten that from Augustine. I happen to agree. He and Calvin were alike. If the scriptures didn't speak on something, they said, be silent. Speak where the scriptures speak. You hear me make this statement all the time, and be silent when they're silent. <laughs> creating hell for people like you ask such dumb questions. <laughs> Of course, that's theologically not correct, that he was making hell before he started making creation, but Augustine would know that, I assume. <laughs> so as we've seen, secular, secularization has led in the last few decades to a retreat or to a withdrawal of religion from many aspects of life and society. And so what theology has concerned itself with is the question, how then can Christianity of the 20th century handle this. And as a result, most people have dreamed up new theologies. There are all types of new theologies going under the name of new orthodoxies. How can Christianity of the 20th century, how can Christianity of the 20th century deal with this new autonomous world situation? So that's my introduction for this morning. I have a lot of material here. I would like to be able to do it in one time because I don't want to spend more time than necessary on Bonhoeffer. Uh, 
So then I guess the next question we would ask, well, where does Bonhoeffer fit in all of this? Well, he fits right smack dab in the middle of the whole debate in question. <clears throat> in his Tegel theology, which you now know is contained in Letters and Papers from Prison, his best known, most often read, best-selling book, Letters and Papers from Prison, Bonhoeffer began to use some very provocative phrases <clears throat> which have now been interpreted in two diametrically opposed ways. We're going to look at one of those ways this morning. We're going to look at another one of those ways next Sunday morning. And then if we have time, I'll give you what I think is the balanced, which is my own view, but a balanced view a balanced interpretation of Bonhoeffer. Just what did Dietrich Bonhoeffer mean by some of the statements that he made? Uh, what statements you say? Well, if you're familiar at all with Bonhoeffer, you're familiar with at least some of these phrases. They are now world famous to anyone who has read Bonhoeffer or who is at all familiar with Bonhoeffer, especially the later Bonhoeffer. Now, I'm not saying that Bonhoeffer changed his mind or opinion. That's one of the whole issues. Are we talking about continuity or discontinuity between his pre-Tegel and his Tegel theology? I think that he stayed consistent in his theology. His phrases, his phrases are new in letters and papers from prison. They are not found in some of his earlier writings. So, let me give you a list. I copied down a list of some of those phrases. Some of them are well known. Others are not as well known. But these are the provocative phrases I'm talking about. I kept using that term last week, provocative phrases, and now this week, provocative, ambiguous phrases. So what are they? <laughs> Here they are. Quote, unquote, these are direct quotes from his book. Christian, and you'll see why we're on it here in Ethics, Christian worldliness. Now, all you got to do is think back a little earlier in one of the choices for world-affirming was under D. Bruce Lockerby, sanctified worldliness. Now, I didn't say much then. I knew we were going to get to this later on. That's just another way of saying what Bonhoeffer said. Christian worldliness, sanctified worldliness, those are almost synonyms. You said the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, I'm assuming Lockerby knows that. I don't know uh, how familiar he really is with what Bonhoeffer's life and theology were all about. It was non-Christian if we're going to base Christianity on the New Testament. I don't know any better thing to base it on. If we're going to judge and critique on the basis of the New Testament, Bonhoeffer falls very, very short in his expressions of Christianity. He uses good Christian terms, discipleship, the cross, and all of this. What does he mean by those, though? What does he really mean? Did he believe in Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, personal Savior, born again? Well, he doesn't use terms like born again, that's for sure. And it seems like anyone who's read the Bible comes across those startling statements of Jesus in John 3 in a hurry. Whether the media picked it up in the 1976 election year or not, even if you lived before then, you should have been familiar with the phrase born again because you know if it happened to you that it happened to you. And Bonhoeffer didn't know. Maybe it didn't happen to him. Christian worldliness, a religionless Christianity. Now, see, they're provocative because they make you sit there and think, now, wait a minute, Christianity is religion. How can you have a religionless religion? And he coined these terms himself purposely because they were ambiguous and provocative. Christianity is a religion. A religionless religion? Religionless secular Christians, another phrase you find. Religionless. Now, that would, to me, kind of seem like a pagan, secular, well, it's a double-dunked pagan, Christian. Well, now, how can you end that phrase with Christian? You're beginning to see why these statements have caused so much controversy. What did Bonhoeffer mean by this? Some more phrases. <laughs> I just really like these. Worldly holiness. Most of them are self-contradictions if you take them literally and strictly like Christian worldliness the Bible says to hate the world and forsake it and if you love the world you don't love the Father you couldn't be a Christian in other words so how could you be 
a worldly Christian? Or how could you be worldly holy? A holy worldly person. And in other words, in Christian terminology through the centuries, those have always been opposites of one another. A holy person versus a worldly one. And now we've got a worldly holy one. That sounds like the religious confusion out there today. And the neo-evangelicals are in the same boat, too. They're using the same term, sanctified worldly. You can't sanctify this world controlled by the powers of darkness. You can't sanctify that. You've got to close your eyes to it and turn your back on it. 1 John 2, 15 to 17, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And then here are his probably best known phrases, these last three. Man come of age, and one right with it, a world come of age. Now that's why I gave you this introductory, which also is a summary statement, that the theologians since the Second World War think that they're dealing with a new world situation. A world come of age, a world grown up, man come of age, man grown up. Do you know what that phrase means? I mean, other people use it, someone come of age. It's like a person who, like a child, who has been under the influence of a lot of uh, childish, superstitious type notions. He doesn't know reality. He's never really met the world. And so you speak of a person coming of age. It means that they finally reach the point of maturity. They're willing to throw off some of their earlier misconceptions, maybe some of their fantasies of, of Christmas and Easter and looking for a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow and these things that children think of. Another phrase of his, he said, we should search for a non-religious interpretation of biblical concepts. That's the longest one a non-religious interpretation of biblical concepts. Okay, now listen to me. Everything we're going to say this morning and next week will be with these phrases as a background. So try to keep them in mind. Think of them yourself. You can obviously probably define each phrase in several different ways. And that's because they're intentionally ambiguous. And so the whole question has been... What did Bonhoeffer mean? So I thought it necessary to give you all the background for his life, his imprisonment, and his writings so we can see these phrases in context. The fact is Bonhoeffer was just beginning to think his way through specifically and in writing these various concepts whenever he was executed. So as I said last time, uh, by nature, they are incomplete, fragmentary, and extremely ambiguous. Bonhoeffer never had the time to completely develop the specific thoughts he was working on, as you can read if you read Letters and Papers from Prison. By the way, I don't know, do any of you have this book? You ever read it before? It's just that, Letters and Papers. As you see, it's all divided up letters. Letters to Bonhoeffer, letters from Bonhoeffer, poems that he wrote, songs that he composed, papers that were written in prison, and so forth, just over and over and over. And then you have a lot of footnotes in here which will try to document or set the setting of each letter. This letter was given under this occasion at this time, and so forth. It's rather difficult to read. I, I wouldn't say run out and buy it. It's, it's difficult to read. You're not going to really get anything worthwhile out of it. Say, well, what are we doing on it then? Well, <laughs> I'm not making you read it, so you should be saying three cheers for that instead of questioning my wisdom. Well, I've read it. I've read it through several times, different parts of it anyway, several times. So I'll get to what I think is an in the interpretation of Bonhoeffer later. But this morning, let's start with the what I would call the radical interpretations of Bonhoeffer. They take Bonhoeffer extremely literal in what he says and rather radically. And I could see in one sense how and why. I mean, look at these phrases, a non-religious interpretation of biblical concepts. In other words, you're, it seems like to me you're almost asking, let's see the Bible from another point of view than the Bible. A non-religious interpretation of biblical concepts. In other words, a worldly interpretation of biblical concepts. So this will be our first thing we're going to be looking at this morning, the major thing, and we're going to look at representatives, various men, theologians, representatives 
who would hold to radical interpretations of Bonhoeffer. So what you might want to entitle this section is not only what I've just given you, radical interpretations of Bonhoeffer, but this specifically, after we get past number one, will concern the 1960s debate over secularity and Christianity. <clears throat> the 1960s debate over secularity and Christianity. This especially involved the radical Protestant death of God, quote unquote, theologians of the 1960s. Do you recall from living in those days that there was a death of God movement? Time magazine even did a cover story on it entitled The Death of God. These were not Catholics, these were Protestant, radical, liberal, Protestant theologians who began this so-called death of God movement. They picked up the phrase, of course, from Nietzsche of the 1800s. Nietzsche was the first one to use this phrase. He coined it, the death of God. And so there were, oh, we're gonna, we'll really enjoy studying all these things in theology or church history detail later on, but there were several popular lay responses to the death of God theology. One was, and I'm sure you'll remember these little catchy things, was to respond to someone, oh, you think God is dead. That couldn't be. I talked to him this morning. You ever heard that little catchy thing? All right, that was a counter development that came out of the 1960s debate over secularity and Christianity. And that was what the whole death of God movement was about, about secularism and secularization. That's why we're putting it here in its context. This is naturally and only really where it fits. The other reaction was that little song that I think we even still sing around here. God's not dead. Oh, no. He is still alive. That song was written during this period to counteract the death of God movement. So I just love observing things like that. You think back, well, what was the origin of this? What are the connections? So that's why I'm giving this to you. And I'm sure you, I know you've heard of the second one. You've sung it around here. The first one I've heard many times. I don't hear as much anymore today as I did back then. Even in the 70s, you would hear it. Oh, God couldn't be dead. I talked to him this morning. And that's supposed to be just, oh, you know, such an, uh, a theological heavyweight argument that they just fall before you and worship God. You know, it didn't actually work that way. But it's a lay response, and it's certainly a good one. That's right. God isn't dead. You did talk to him this morning. He's certainly alive. But uh, the death of God theologians would just laugh at you if you gave them that response. But let them laugh. You're going to be laughing all your way to heaven. <laughs> so what these men did, they picked up Bonhoeffer's terms. Now listen to this carefully. Here's, here's where it is. They picked up Bonhoeffer's terms, and they made him say through them what they were saying in the 1960s. Bonhoeffer writing in the early 1940s, 20 years apart. You see, Bonhoeffer didn't tell us what he meant. He just gave us the terms. He wrote to his friends. I'll read these portions later where I've, you know, actually, you'll actually find these words. He writes to his friends, you know, I've been thinking about struggling with the world come of age. And then he doesn't say much more about it. He does, just doesn't give us much information. That's why he's left the door open for anybody to interpret Bonhoeffer any way they want to interpret it. And so what the death of... And the, you see, the death of God theologians already knew that Bonhoeffer was a world-renowned figure. So if you could use someone else's terminology, you could borrow from them, you know, go into the limelight on someone else's coattails. You could make him, since he's dead and can't defend himself, you could make him say what you want him to say, what you're saying, simply by using his phrases because his phrases could be interpreted that way. So that's what it's all about, what these men were going to be discussing. Uh, technology, they said, and modernization have set us free from our pre-scientific views and need of religion. Man come of age. A world come of age. That's exactly what we've been discussing already, folks, in secularization. Man doesn't need God anymore. He's come of age with technology and modernization. 
man in the new age no longer needs this crutch of belief in a nature God. So often in scriptures do we not see him in a nature role, in creation, in the Exodus, in the Psalms, in Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. You see God in a nature role all the time. Well, that was one of the most prevalent ancient forms of false religion, worshiping nature as God. And so these theologians see that same error and tendency in the Bible to view God as an old nature God that sends the storms and the lightning. And of course we know that doesn't happen. There are um, reasons that can be explained by a meteorologist why certain things happen in the environment. God's not the one that does that. There are reasons. There are logical explanations for it. So practically speaking, the need for God has died. That's what they meant by the catchphrase, death of God. They didn't believe that God one time was alive and then he died. They never believed that because they never believed God ever existed. It was a catchphrase that meant the need for God. The need of modern man for God has come to an end. That was the origin for the catchphrase, death of God. They never felt that God died. If you ask them, do you believe God died, you know, literally, well, no. And they wouldn't say like you would say, well, I don't believe he died because that'd be impossible for God to die. They would say, well, it goes back earlier than that. God never was born. God never existed. So obviously we couldn't literally mean the death of God, but man's need for God has come to an end. All right, what I'm giving you is, the, is basically a summing up of the interpretation of the radical scholars of these provocative, ambiguous phrases in Bonhoeffer's Tegel theology. Many people would argue, however, that this is not at all what Bonhoeffer meant, which will be our subject next week. I'll just say a little about that now to put it in context. These people who would argue against this interpretation, and I would be one of them, would point out the fact that Bonhoeffer continued his religious life in prison. As a matter of fact, one very interesting thing to note, and I did personally myself about letters and papers from prison, is that Bonhoeffer, this is very interesting here, and this is one of the best proofs against the radical interpretation of Bonhoeffer, that he was just through with God, wanted to just live his life without any reference or recourse to the deity. Bonhoeffer in prison evidently has no eye on a regular calendar. He has no eye on a regular calendar at all. His eye is on the religious calendar of, you know, holy days and festivals and feast times and seasons and so forth. And as a result, that causes him to occasionally misdate his letters. That's something remarkable. He misdates some of his letters it's because he's not going by a calendar that gives the dates there. He is, in other words, so caught up in his religious life, he's going by a religious calendar, and he only approximates the date of some of his letters. Now, that will become very crucial, and I'll say that again next week if you didn't get all of that down now or understand it, in counteracting this radical trend to interpret Bonhoeffer. He has his eye on the church calendar. In other words, uh, if you had your eye on a religious calendar, then it'd be around, you know, Pentecost and Easter and Christmas and so forth. And you might be somewhere near Christmas, and you don't know exactly how many days until Christmas until it gets here. And then you, then you can look, and you might misdate a letter. You might say it's, you know, the um, 17th of December instead of the 18th or the 16th. Because you're not so much concerned about 16, 17, and 18. You're concerned about the 25th of December. Your whole life revolves around each of these religious holy days or sacred times and so forth. So that, to me, is a very strong proof of the fact that Bonhoeffer continued his religious life and existence in prison. Maybe even stepped it up a notch, knowing that this was, it was for keeps now. Although he was certainly very deluded in his religious notions. You have any questions on any of that thus far? I'm going to get into specific names, representatives of radical death of God theology. <clears throat>
That should be fairly easy, I think, to follow and to understand. Okay, let me give you some names. We'll start number one here with Friedrich Gogarten. Now, he's the earliest example, and let me say he is not a 1960s death of God theologian. He comes earlier than that. Friedrich Gogarten. But, although he was not a 1960s death of God theologian, he was the one who championed the idea that secularism was actually the logical outcome and outgrowth of Christianity. Now, you see, a whole lot of people would say secularism is inspired of the pit. It's opposed to Christianity, not Gogarten. Gogarten felt, and I'll show you where he based this in the Bible, that secularism is actually the logical outcome and outgrowth of Christianity. His theory was based on Galatians 4, verses 1 to 7. If you'll flip over there and let's just note this very, very quickly. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Now, surely in this passage, you're going to be able to see the themes of bondage and liberty. And they're going to be said over against the old versus the new. Remember the introductory statement I gave you that theologians from the war years have thought they had to deal realistically with a new world situation of human autonomy created by science and technology. Paul writes, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, what do you think they would say Paul meant here in a verse like verse 3? Even so, when we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Well, we were, back in our earlier pre-scientific, pre-modern days, were under the bondage of superstitious notions about a nature god. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. And they they don't interpret this as, you know, having a literal reference to the historical Jesus Christ. They just got vague ways of saying God has somehow liberated us. To redeem them. See, it's a theme of bondage and redemption, the old versus the new. To redeem them that were under the that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, here's his conclusion, wherefore, same translation as therefore, the D in Greek, or therefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, I know for some of you, you may have a little difficulty. Well, if they interpret verse 3 like that, well, what do they do about being an heir of God, a son of God, an heir of God through Christ? Just they just explain it away mystically. Because there is no son of God, because there is no God. And if God had a son, he couldn't be eternal because sons, by, by nature of sonship, have to be born. So they have ways of explaining all of that away. In other words, basically what they do is they run to the Bible and try to find a proof text, a support for what they want to say. And they've got it in verse 3 along with verse 5a. When we were children back in our naive Old Testament, New Testament days, well, all the way up to, what, 1500, 1600, 1700, you know, before the rise of modern science and technology, then we were in bondage under the elements of the world thinking that sickness came from demons or the devil or thinking that rain came from a god above. When there, it comes from rain clouds. Everyone knows where rain comes from now. We've got ways of explaining how it drops and why it drops and where it drops. And So those were our pre-scientific naive notions as children. So you see, he uses this passage to show that secularism is actually the logical outcome and outgrowth of Christianity. 
That's where man was headed all along. That's where God, quote unquote, wanted man to go all along. Of course, there is no God. Old Testament religion kept the Israelites under all forms of bondage and superstition. And the man, Jesus, that shadowy figure whom we think we know, but we're not for sure and we're not certain that he ever really came, came to show us what true religion was all about. What was it about? It was about serving your neighbor. It didn't have any reference to God. It was about doing good. That's why the parable of the Good Samaritan has been so famous in church history. It's often been abused, too often abused rather than used. And so if Jesus came to show us what true religion was all about, what was true religion? Well, for them it was no, quote, religion, unquote. It was simply teaching us how to live life to its fullest extent. In other words, be worldly. That basically is the contribution of Friedrich Gogarten, who was kind of the founding father of this one particular uh, sub-theory of worldliness, and that is that secularism is the outgrowth of Christianity. For the continuation of... who was kind of the founding father of this one particular uh, sub-theory of worldliness, and that is that secularism is the outgrowth of Christianity. Most people wouldn't go so far as to say that. Gogarten was the first one who had the presumption to say that, that all these things we've been discussing as being evil and negative, secularism, an outgrowth of Christianity, well, hardly. I mean, it's... Uh, it's on the other end of the pole from Christianity, but Gogarten didn't feel this. He happened to also be one who used the phrases, man and world come of age, on the basis of Galatians 4, verses 1 to 7. That was his proof passage. Man and world come of age. Those aren't unique to Bonhoeffer, of course. They're used by other people besides religious people also, as you know. Gogarten expressed his views, he was a German, by the way, and wrote in German, in a book entitled The Reality of Faith. I just had the date for the English translation, 1959. So see, he's writing actually before the 1960s, and that, I forget the date, it was much earlier than this. This was just the English translation, The Reality of Faith. He had another book entitled Despair and Hope for Our Time. English translation date, 1970. Okay, then in 1966, Larry Shiner, I'm still under number one, Go Garten. Larry Shiner, S-H-I-N-E-R, gave us our first and really only complete presentation of Gogarten's views in his book entitled The Secularization of History, An Introduction to the Theology of Friedrich Gogarten. It's a rather imposing book. 1966, Larry Shiner gave us really our only complete presentation of Gogarten's views in his book entitled The Secularization of History, An Introduction to the Theology of Friedrich Gogarten. So, although Gogarten is actually earlier than the 1960s, he was actually the one who gave secular Christianity its most complete defense. Remember, that's what we're looking at after looking at seculariz secularization, secularism, modern technology. I said the next thing was secular Christianity. <coughs> Gagartin is actually the one who gave secular Christianity its most complete defense. However, there were others to come after him who popularized 
the movement because Gogarten's name is certainly not a well-known one. No, what we had, we had the death of God theologians in the 1960s who took Bonhoeffer's terms, Gogarten's theory of logical outcome, combined them and popularized them. All right, I'll say that again. The 1960s death of God theologians took the terms of Bonhoeffer, took the theory of logical outcome from Gogarten, combined them, and popularized them. So you're getting a, an introduction to the scene behind the development of the death of God theology that came right out of these theories and writings and studies concerning secularism and secularization. So you can, maybe you can see better this morning why uh, Bonhoeffer fits in no better place that I can think of than where we're studying right now of all places in Christian ethics because his writings combined with all these others, they're all surrounding involving the issues of secularism, secularization, a world come of age, modern technology. We're dealing with a new world situation that we haven't experienced in earlier centuries and so forth. And so he very appropriately fits here. As I think I've also said earlier, you could study him in historical theology, but Bonhoeffer is not a theologian per se. He was a German pastor and a radical critic of Nazi Germany, a reformer, and ends up being a martyr for his cause. All right, then number two, another man, and I said Gogarten was not a 1960s Death of God theologian. You'll never see his name, so I don't intend to imply by including him here that if you looked up Death of God theology, you'd find his name as being a 1960s representative because that simply wouldn't be true. Most of these others are, though. Uh, number two, Paul Van Buren. Paul Van Buren. One of the first major books to appear in the 1960s advocating a death of God theology and appealing to Bonhoeffer was Paul Van Buren's book entitled The Secular Meaning of the Gospel. You'll notice that the titles of all of these works from here on, will have the term secular in them. The secular meaning of the gospel, 1963. It's subtitled an original inquiry. And that's this book right here. Now, Paul Van Buren was one of the early death of God theologians. He was the earliest one, as a matter of fact, that we're going to be discussing here that published material. Other death of God theologians will not fit under our study this morning because they didn't approach saying so much from the Bonhoeffer Gogarten premises. Now although Van Buren, here's, he was a professor at um, the Episcopal Theological Seminary <laughs> in Austin, Texas. Here's a picture of him. I guess that's a good 1960s early 60s haircut and picture but there's a picture of Van Buren uh, although Van Buren denied that he was part of the movement he starts off denying that he was a part of the death of God movement which was just really gaining steam then uh, he was in fact very much a part of the movement He appeals to Bonhoeffer on page one of his book. That's how long you have to wait to find out whether or not he's going to make any connections with Bonhoeffer. I'm on page one, chapter one, which is introduction, which is entitled The Contemporary Problem for Theology and Faith, A Secular Understanding of the Gospel. That's the contemporary problem. Is how do you relate the gospel to modern man? You, you can't relate it. You, are you following what these guys are after? You can't relate it in the four Gospels. Casting out demons, healing the sick, lame people, 
stilling the storm at sea, you, you can't relate that to today because those things don't happen. Those are myths back there. How do you relate the, what was Jesus after, after all? What did he really say? Somehow bring that to us today. And what they'll give you is a lot of, I'll tell you what they'll give you. They'll give you a lot of deception. They'll give you a lot of Galatians 4 and Luke 4. Jesus came to set the captives free. And you know how they interpret that wildly, as liberally as possible, came to set us free from notions about plagues and exodus and crossing Red Sea and the creation of the world and six literal days. And he came to set the captives free. We've been in prison with these pre-scientific, naive, childish, superstitious notions for so many centuries, and he came to set us free. The problem is he came teaching the same things, though. He came teaching and doing the same type of pre-scientific superstitious notions. But then they have a way of getting out that, of that. He accommodated himself to the people. He didn't really believe in demons and miracles and things. He accommodated himself to the people. Well, then what you've done is you've made him a master magician. And that would be heresy of the first order. You're going to have to be like C.S. Lewis. You can either take him as son of God or a blasphemer. There's nothing in between. He didn't leave us any ground in between. Son of God, working miracles, being who he was, doing what he claimed, being from where he claimed he was from, or as a heretic, a blasphemer, a son of the devil. So after the title of this chapter, then I have a quote. Honesty demands that we recognize that we must live in the world as if there was no God. And this is just what we do recognize before God. Now, I'm going to read this again. God himself drives us to this realization. God makes us know that we must live as men who can get along without him. That God who is with us, the God who is with us is the God who forsakes us. We stand continually in the presence of the God who makes us live in the world without the God hypothesis. With these words, Dietrich Bonhoeffer described his situation as a Christian in a world come of age. In other words, the first thing he does is quote Bonhoeffer, first page, in which men no longer believe in a transcendent realm where their longings will be fulfilled. Wishing not to retreat from this new world, Bonhoeffer began what he called a, and he quotes, non-religious interpretation of biblical concepts. There's that phrase I gave you. You see it over and over again. He had scarcely the time to outline his proposal in a few letters written from prison before his death. And then he goes on. Let me go back to Bonhoeffer's quote that he starts his book off with. And you notice that, and this is just so characteristic of these liberal scholars, they speak out of both sides of their mouths with absolute confusion. Honesty demands, said Bonhoeffer, that we recognize that we must live in the world as if there were no God. And this is just what we do recognize before God. You just contradicted yourself there. The God who doesn't live, God himself drives us to this realization. God makes us know that we must live as men who can get along without him. That is without recourse to him all the time, going to him in prayer. Because you see, what these men are saying is Christians through the years have used that as a cop-out for social responsibility in life. We've looked at this earlier. They're praying to God to do something instead of getting out there, rolling up their sleeves and getting their own hands dirty. That Christians have used that for a cop-out. Well, they might have. I mean, probably that is somewhat true. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. That the God who is with us is also the God who forsakes us. They're always saying opposites, and they think that's so cute. And they say that so you can never pin them down. If you ask them, well, do you believe God exists? Well, he would say, well, look at this sentence. We're living before God. Do you believe that he doesn't exist? Yes, God doesn't exist. Well, you can't have both. But they find out a way of having it. We stand continually in the presence of the God who makes us live in the world without the God hypothesis without the God hypothesis. Now, that's Bonhoeffer writing. I'd say Bonhoeffer's unsaved to make statements like that. You'll find a whole segment of the evangelical church that just rallies around Bonhoeffer. I was reading another one of uh, Chuck Colson's books, and he just rallies around Bonhoeffer, especially the cost of discipleship, because it's such a well-known, provocative book about cheap grace versus costly grace. And I think, hey, do you people not know what you're doing? 
you're rallying around an unsaved man, an unsaved scholar, an unsaved theologian who tells us that we are supposed to live in the world without reference to the God hypothesis. On the contrary, Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. Amen. They're saying we're supposed to do everything without him. The scriptures will contradict that. Nonsense. It is nonsense. I have little patience with people who read Bonhoeffer and love Bonhoeffer who are in the church and who should know better. But Bonhoeffer, I told you before, his provocative statements, the fact that he was opposed to Hitler and died a martyr, have just put a glow around him that cannot be penetrated by any criticism in the evangelical world. But my views of Bonhoeffer will be coming out very strongly as we go along. I think Bonhoeffer had a lot of good things to say, but so did Socrates and Plato, though. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. He used some interesting terminology. I have adopted some of it. I like to speak of costly grace versus cheap grace. That's good. It's too bad Bonhoeffer didn't know what grace was all about. It's too bad he hadn't experienced the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So we might can borrow something from others without agreeing with them. And you say, well, if you're doing that, maybe others are. Well, the problem is others aren't critical of him like I am. They just seem to accept everything he has to say. Swallowed hook, line, and sinker, as the saying goes. So back to Paul Van Buren, you don't even have to get anywhere in his book, page one, page one, and he's already appealing to Bonhoeffer, he's already appealing to Bonhoeffer's phrases and terms, a religion-less interpretation, a non-religious interpretation of biblical concepts. Paul Van Buren's book is basically a book on Christology. I have read it, by the way. I wouldn't have to to know something about it, but it's basically a book on Christology. And here is Paul Van Buren's thesis, what his whole book is about. Only through the technical use of linguistic analysis or philosophy can we understand what the gospel message says to us today. He's the only death of God theologian who approaches the matter from this point of view. That is linguistic analysis. Through the technical use of linguistic analysis. Only through that can we hope to understand what the gospel is saying to us today. What that means is his book is just nothing but one big boring nothing. <laughs> 200 pages, linguistic analysis. In other words, he completely accepts empiricism, which states that things which cannot be verified empirically are meaningless. So we're back to modern science and technology, the weighing, touching, seeing, analyzing, putting in a test tube, measuring. He completely accepts the theory, and it's nothing but a theory, of empiricism. You know what empiricism is? If something is empirically verifiable, it can be verified physically with the five senses. It can be verified. The existence of God will not meet that criterion. It cannot be verified with our senses. So, because he completely accepts the theory of empiricism, I just assumed you'd heard of that term, then things which cannot be verified empirically are meaningless. And since no biblical language can be verified, any that speaks about God, his power, his love, his grace, his deity, his preexistence, his immensity, his eternalness, since no biblical language that speaks about God can be verified, therefore, the concept of God is meaningless. That's good old atheistic philosophy for you. He quotes others like the well-known, what, what is he, British philosopher, uh, Anthony Flew. I think he's got Flew right at the very beginning of his book. Yeah, page three, after Bonhoeffer, he goes to Flew and gives a well-known example about a garden. I'll give that to you sometime. We look at philosophy. Flew has some, he debated about the resurrection of Christ down at Lynchburg's 
college, uh, down at Falwell's College in Lynch Lynchburg not long ago. There's even a book out on that now where Flew debated some faculty members at uh, Liberty University about the resurrection of Christ. But you don't get anywhere debating people, though. Right. And you especially don't get anywhere debating someone who already has their mind made up. Yeah. Flew is one of the world's leading philosophers, a British philosopher. And he has some really interesting ways of disproving the existence of God. And so the best response, I guess, is that lay Christian response. He must exist because I talked to him this morning. Nothing else you can say means anything to them. Not that that does, but you could go to the Bible and they could disprove that easily with their notions. So the best thing to say is, well, it doesn't matter what you say. I know he exists because he lives in my heart and he talked with me this morning. I still like that little thing. I never have gotten away from it. I know he's alive because I spoke with him this morning. Dead people don't talk. So Van Buren's conclusion was, since no biblical language can be empirically verified, therefore the concept of God is meaningless. So what does he mean then by the secular meaning of the gospel? The name of his book, the secular meaning of the gospel. What is the secular meaning of the gospel? Okay, Van Buren would say it's this. Basically, man is free to live and think as he himself wishes. Obviously, that's the conclusion. There is no God. Now, how can this man be a Christian? There is no God. Man can live and think as, and believe as he wishes. The secular meaning of the gospel. <coughs> Let me give you a few statements from Van Buren. If I don't get through this morning, we'll just have to continue later. On page 130, the statement... Jesus is risen is linguistically an exceedingly odd assertion. Well, who cares what, what type of... I mean, it's either he did or he didn't, but he gets into this linguistic analysis. It's linguistically an exceedingly odd assertion. The evidence indicates that the apostles did not intend to assert a physical resuscitation of the dead Jesus. The, quote, risen body was not like the earthly body. Although it bore the marks of the crucifixion, the disciples had some difficulty in recognizing the risen Jesus. See, what he's after all after here is that the dead don't rise. He, he wasn't resurrected bodily because he didn't appear the same. The disciples themselves couldn't recognize him. Where we're told that he hid himself from them. He had some way of darkening their understanding so they didn't recognize him. If he ate with them, according to some accounts, he also appeared and disappeared in a most unbodily fashion. See how we believe in the bodily resurrection? But look, he takes our own gospel accounts and says, Now look, if you can pass through walls and doors without opening them, obviously it wasn't a bodily resurrection because bodies can't do that. So he has a very neat way of getting out of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. You never thought of that probably before. You believe in a bodily resurrection, but you also believe that he could pass through doors without opening them. So often our critics are the ones who think of things we don't think of, but they think of things that aren't worth thinking about. Because <laughs> what will that do but rob you of your faith then? The linguistic oddity of the statement, Jesus is risen, comes from the juxtaposition of words from two dissimilar language games. The word Jesus is a proper name. And we may assume that it functions as any other proper name would function. Logically, it would be improper to use the word is of anyone who had died. You'd have to use was. But in this case, is forms part of a verb which had its logical placing in Jewish eschatology in the hope and its expression of a future given by God. And every time he uses the word God is quote unquote or Jesus is quote unquote or risen or dead is quote unquote. The word risen, <laughs> this is just makes your even mashed potatoes taste bad here. <laughs> the word risen was at home in the context of such phrases as quote kingdom of God and quote a new heaven and a new earth which were used to point to the end and goal of all existence. So the assertion Jesus is risen takes the name of a historical man and says that he was of the realm of the end. What sort of verification could apply to such a proposition? Is it even a proposition? Clearly it is not a straightforward 
empirical one. Well, the apostles took it as empirical one because Paul kept saying over and over, they saw him, they saw him. In 1 Corinthians 15, over 500 brethren at once saw him. It was empirically verified, not that it has to be, not that it has to be. Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and have not seen me, but it was verified for the first century. Uh, next page. It seems appropriate to say, I remember reading this, and this just... I just could hardly get through it. I could hardly wait, you know, for coffee break at the end of it. It's just such <laughs> nonsense. It seems appropriate to say that a situation of discernment occurred for Peter and the other disciples at Easter in which, against the background of their memory of Jesus, they suddenly saw Jesus in a new and unexpected way. The light dawned, quote, unquote. The history of Jesus, which seemed to have been a failure, took on a new importance as the key to the meaning of history. Out of this discernment arose a commitment to the way of life which Jesus had followed. Had followed. He didn't rise from the dead. Had followed. Let's see what he's got to say later. Page 177. Recent studies of the creation stories in Genesis show that they were shaped by Israel's experience of the Exodus. And in their present form, they express the Israelites' understanding of themselves as the people of the covenant. Because the Israelites saw themselves as a people brought into national existence out of nothing. You know, just slavery at, into nationhood. Because they saw themselves brought into national existence out of nothing by the event of the Exodus, they turned around and tended to see creation as coming from out of nothing. See, that's the way they would explain that. Because they rose out of nothing, then that was their view of cosmology and cosmogony. Next page. The traditional biblical text for this doctrine, oh, he's talking about uh, sin here in this chapter. The traditional biblical text for this doctrine is the story of the fall, quote, unquote, the fall, in chapter 3 of Genesis. The doctrine of the fall and of man's original sin, quote unquote, is explicit in surprisingly few passages of the New Testament, considering its significant role in the history of Christian thought. In other words, guilt by lack of reference there. It only appears a couple of times in the New Testament, therefore it's not valid or true. The unique aspect of the Christian perspective of sin, however, is its own definition of what is wrong with man and its own measure of the extent or depth of his problem. In the New Testament, man is seen in the light of the free man, Jesus of Nazareth, and compared to him, men are not free. They are bound by fear and anxiety, mistrust and self-concern. The word sin, then, is used to describe this condition when measured by this standard. The logical, in other words, he denies all the historicity. You know, sin is just a, a lack of self-confidence, basically, is sin. If you have fear, a lack of self-confidence, that is sin. Because it's measured against the standard of Jesus, who was a free man. And we're supposed to be free men. So he says his definition of sin is, quote, something wrong, unquote. Something wrong. That's a pretty shallow definition of sin, something wrong. John says all unrighteousness is sin, not what's wrong. Many things are wrong that are not necessarily sin. It can be broken, your car, and not be sinful. The logical structure of this teaching does not depend on the story of the fall or even on a theory of inherited guilt. Notice he calls it a theory. The various traditional forms of the doctrine of original sin are not empirical observations about man. They are comparative statements of man's condition measured by the historical standard of the man Jesus of Nazareth. So, so much for Paul Van Buren. What you have here is pure liberalism, unadulterated liberalism, just under a different guise. And by the way, in his book, he repeatedly, and I'm always suspicious of someone who denies something too often, he repeatedly denies that he's a liberal. 
Well, when someone goes, you know, no, I didn't steal it. No, I didn't. I promise. I swear. <laughs> yes, you did. You're telling me that you did. He repeatedly denies. Now, I just want you to know, dear reader, that I'm not a liberal, that this is not liberalism. Then I have to smile about the third or fourth or 84th time I read that. I have to smile. It's pure liberalism under a different guise. Well, praise the Lord, good news or bad news. I don't know how you're going to take it. We're going to stop there this morning. I don't have any more time to go any further. So we just looked at two men, Gogarten and Paul Van Buren. And we'll pick up with a number three and a number four next time. And we'll see how much time we have then. No sense in making any predictions. I would like to minister a song that's called It Will Only Last If It's Eternal. Mm -hmm. 